Hello, everyone, and thanks for the warm welcome. Uh, we are here today to um, talk about Open the Gates, the insecurities of cloudless smart door systems. I'm here with my colleagues. Hi, I'm Julian. Uh, that's, yeah, that's me. Right. Hello. Hey there. Let's wait for WebEx camera stuff to activate. All right, there I am. I'm Sebastian. Yeah. Thanks, you two, and my name is Lars, and uh, I will give you a short overview about what we will do today. Uh, first, I will introduce you to uh, what we've done and what exactly we looked into. Um, then we will head into the technical side and go into the deeper analysis and look at some now not so live demos. and. In the end, we will have a look at what we've learned and how we disclosed it and yeah, that whole thing. So what is a smart gateway? Um, it's complex at first. So let's start at the bottom. You have all seen physical doors and they are in most cases controlled by a door controller. And in many cases, I would Yes, today uh, they are still connected to a, I call it classical door opening system. So some wire and some buzzer on the other side. And if somebody rings the bell, uh, somebody on the inside can press the buzzer and the door will open up. Or there's even some door communication in there. Some are already equipped with cameras and stuff, but that's like, even for us now too old, uh, we are going to take a step further and look on the uh, red side of this diagram. And there you can see the smart gateway, which is connecting the door controller to a router so that it gets connected to some network. The point is that you basically uh, take your whole setup with on how you open doors, who has access rights to open some doors and everything and take it from a from a physical level like I'm inside so I'm allowed to let other people inside to a more yeah computerized way in yeah and in this digital form you can just create users like bef like for any other system but in this case they don't have the access right to a program or something. They have rights to open doors and stuff like that. Um, so why would you like to integrate such a system into your physical security? Well, for once, it's convenient. You can open the door from everywhere. So if it's just like some small home application, you can sit on your couch and just open it from your smartphone or even if you're not at home and let your kids in or whatever. But we will focus more on a, well, bigger scaled solution here and therefore probably maintenance is bigger of an issue than convenient. I mean, it's also convenient if you only have like one person at the front desk who is also running around in the building, connecting to people all the time. And so your front desk actually doesn't have to be at the front desk all the time anymore, but can move around, which is convenient. So they can do other jobs instead of just wait around the whole day. And furthermore, it's easy to maintain. So uh, everybody can connect in there and you don't have like keys or key cards or physical tokens or uh, pins you have to change whenever somebody leaves the company or something you can just remove the user and then they yeah lose their access rights so it's easier to maintain um so now um, what if it's that easy to remove somebody or add somebody? How easy is it for us to add ourselves in there? Or how convenient is it for us to break in? Because the impact of us 
beam in that system is pretty high because physical security is basically rarely considered uh, in threat models or it is considered in threat models, but in a way like, yeah, they won't get physical access into our building because we straight up don't allow them in. And, but what if we can allow ourselves in? Or further, what if this device, which, um, yeah, connects all the doors is in your network, which it needs to be, but isn't monitored because who monitors its door entry system? I mean, you monitor your computer and stuff people download there or whatever, but probably not your door system. So you may have an entry point for some stealthy, permanent, persistent access rights into the network, which is also quite dangerous. So now let's see which uh, devices exactly we looked into. We looked at first into the whole market and searched for a well, good candidate to look into. And pretty soon it was clear there are quite a lot of cloud-based solutions, which we cannot fully test because that would include some attacks on the cloud or at least some tried attacks on the cloud. And they come with pretty rough legal consequences. And as we don't want to face those, uh, we excluded cloud-based variations. And then further, we uh, focused on uh, German uh, market competitors. And yeah, from there we looked around and searched for downloadable firmware so we don't have like a huge upfront cost without any knowledge whether it will go somewhere, but have at least some indices whether our research is going to pay off or not before we actually invest heavy money into gadgets. Which led us to the final results of the Siedler Smart Gateway SG150 and the TKS IP Gateway. Um, but at first we downloaded uh, that firmware, as I said, and put it on a Raspberry Pi and try to set it up as well as possible and then yeah pen test it and we found some vulnerabilities in there but as we weren't sure whether those will actually work out in the real device we said okay we have enough indices and indicators to look closer into it so Let's do it. We got the gadgets and we look closer into it. And this is where Julian will take over and show you the closer look. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lars. Let's start with the technical analysis. Right. Um, first, our general approach, which, uh, our general approach basically was, uh, we first looked, as Lars said, at the firmware that we could download, uh, put it onto the Raspberry Pi and then just look at it for the first time and basically try to look through files, try to see what services are running um, and so on and so forth. Uh, then we basically bought the device. Then we, we ah, nee, warte, ich mach, ich mach uh, thank you, Lars. Uh, let's start with the technical analysis. So first, our general approach to the technical analysis, uh, analysis was basically that we first, as Lars said, looked at the firmware that we downloaded, play, uh, put it onto the Raspberry Pi, uh, looked, at, looked at it on the Raspberry Pi, tried to see which services are running, um, which ports are open, uh, what could we find there. Um, after finding the first couple of vulnerabilities on there, we then decided to buy the device. And after we bought the device, we looked at the device itself. Uh, are there any physical um, avenues we could take to uh, basically get foothold on the device, or are there any any uh, vulnerabilities on the physical uh, side? Uh, after that, we tried to pursue our actual research question, which was: Can we get access to the interface that allows us to reconfigure 
the doors and the access uh, to basically every device that is con that is connected to the gateway. Um, after we managed that, we wanted to go further and try to root the device, uh, get basically root access, um, and try to get yeah, try to see if we can if we can do that. Uh, after even managing that, we basically wrote a big report for uh, both of the of the devices we looked at, uh, sent them to the to the vendor, and started the whole disclosure process, and uh, yeah, basically told them uh, told them the vulnerabilities we found. So let's play that on uh, with the first first device we looked at, the Zilla Smart Gateway SG one hundred fifty. Uh, you can see the device here on the right side opened up. Um, it's basically just a Linux-based system, so it's just a Linux computer on an ARM chip. So we felt right at home. Um, in the initial firmware uh, look through, we already found some static credentials, um, namely, most importantly, the MySQL administrative password, which will come in handy in a second. Um, then we looked at the open ports which uh, were three notable ones, the web server, the SSH server, and port 10,000. Um, port 10,000 because it was the RPC server that uh, that communicated with the iOS app. It was written in Java. And because we tried to set up the device as close to the manual as possible to avoid the argument that we just set it up in a malicious, uh, or in a purposefully malicious way, uh, we just try to do our best to be as true to the to the manual and as true as to how a, a contractor would try to set up the device. Um, and part of that was that the the manual actually specific, specified that port ten thousand is the only port that is supposed to be forwarded through your firewall. So the only caveat for this entire exploit chain is that you already need access to the local network of the company where this. Uh, or the, the building that where this device is installed, and you have to be, be basically behind the firewall um, and be in the same network as as the uh, as a, uh, the smart gateway. Right. So let's look at the first two vulnerabilities we found. Um, the first vulnerability is that the FTP user does not have a, a password set. With that, I mean in the etc shadow, there is an actually completely empty entry. For the, in the password for the FTP user. This is usually the case when the password has either expired or hasn't been set yet. Um, and you are basically then asked to just set the password, um, which is convenient for us because then we can have, an, or we already have an account now uh, on the device. The only problem with that with that account is that um, the shell for, for the FTP user has been false. That doesn't really help us because we want shell access to the device. Um, the only thing that, or the thing that we could uh, do with the user, though, uh, is port forwarding. This is interesting be because we can now forward the local MySQL server that is bound to the loopback interface um, to an outside device, in the case, uh, our computer. And now we basically gain access to the MySQL database uh, via the port forwarding. Uh, which we previously previously could not access. Um, the MySQL database is interesting because the this database handles all the configuration for the web front end. Uh, the web front end is where all the configuration for the devices that are connected to the smart gateway happens, and it it is also responsible for all the account management on the um, on the actual web front end. So. With access to the database, we could just insert a new administrative account and we could just insert our own. So this way we gained, uh, we already gained basically access to the interface that allows us to reconfigure doors and we could now technically break in to every door uh, that we wanted to that is connected to the already, uh, yeah, already broken device. Um, but we wanted to go further and to go further, we need our second vulnerability that we found. Um, in the config and uh, configuration backup and restore feature of the web front end, uh, you can basically download the configuration as a .sql file. This is rather convenient for the device because it just can apply this .sql file to the database and just rebuild the entire database from scratch uh, with the already saved configurations in the .sql file. Um, 
It is also convenient for us because uh, MySQL allows for the following syntax, backslash exclamation mark and then a shell command, and we just execute the shell command as the MySQL user or as the user that is running the MySQL database, in our case, the MySQL user. Um, and this way we could basically just execute commands as the MySQL user and insert a SSH key to uh, to the my uh, to the dot uh, sql dot uh, ssh folder from the mysql uh, user which allowed us to gain ssh access as the mysql user onto the device right so now let's take a look at how this would basically look like in a sadly not so live demo so at first we Log in as the FTP user, and this is the prompt that I mentioned earlier. In this case, the password has expired, and we have to set a new password for the FTP user. Um, then we can do the port forwarding, and we forward the MySQL port to our local port 1337. And now we can just connect to it via MySQL. And then we go through the actual database and insert our own account here called hacker with our own password that we controlled. And we also said uh, that this account is an admin. Right, and now we can, as you can see, log in to the web front end as our account. Um, yeah, and now we have an account. Um, so now we could basically just reconfigure everything that we want, or we can go further and do the restoration process. Here we just restore the configuration uh, data, which is, as I said, the .sql file. Um, so it doesn't come as a .sql file, it is actually a squashfs that you can just unsquash. Um, and then a couple directories deep, uh, you find the .sql uh, file, as seen here. There it is. We can just edit that. And as I said, it's just a .sql file, like you would normally see. Um, and then we just add the couple lines that will create the .ssh folder, add the ssh key to the authorized keys, and set a couple of writes to the directory, uh, repackage the entire thing, and just upload it. Right. So, as I said, the, um, the backup will actually restore the entire configuration as it, were, as it was at the point where we downloaded the, the configuration backup. So our hacker account is still on there. Right. But we can now com uh, execute commands via, uh, over SSH via the MySQL user um, as seen here, which is very convenient. So let's go, let's, let's go to the, third, uh, to the th third vulnerability and to the last interesting point of the uh, exploit chain, which is getting root. Uh, we looked quite quite a lot on the device uh, to gain root access, and we finally managed to do that by a race condition in LockRotate. Um, this is this was pretty complicated because uh, well you'll you'll see in a second. First, the the race condition itself. Um, the race condition happens in these four lines or the first four code lines of the uh, of this LockRotate script here. Um, basically, just moves the the old MySQL log to MySQL log dot uh, dot log minus old. It touches a new log and gives the writes to that log to the MySQL user. Now, there's a time between the move and the touch where a second process could technically just insert a zim link to a different file. And log rotate now would create this file where the zim link points to and gives the writes to the MySQL user to this file. This is interesting because now we can basically create files in directories where we normally would not be able to create files in and also write into these files. Um, in our case, we uh, chose LockRotate D because LockRotate runs as the root user. And now we basically have a script that every time LockRotate triggers um, would be executed via LockRotate as the root user. And we, what we, we basically put in there that uh, we have a file in slash temp called get root. There's the, sec uh, the second four lines of a log rotate script there. Um, we have a file get root in temp, and we give the writes to that user uh, to that file to root, and then set the executable bits and the suad bit. So this is basically sudo without a password. 
Um, yeah. The problem with this entire approach basically was that the, the these four lines of log rotate, the first four lines of log rotate, which are for the MySQL log, um, are inside an if condition where the where the actual branch that is usually been taken um, is not those four uh, four lines of ex, uh, of of uh, my uh, of log rotate script. Um, the problem here is that uh, the there is a command called MySQL admin which does a ping to the MySQL database. And when this command returns a zero as a status code, it will just use MySQL to flush the logs. It, that's a feature of MySQL admin, which basically does the uh, does this entire thing just like that. Um, basically, sort of atomic. Um, so we couldn't we couldn't really do that. Um, so we first had to trick MySQL admin into returning a one as a status code, which was pretty hard because it would always return one in the case, uh, it, was, uh, it would always re return zero, sorry, zero, in the case that the MySQL server is actually running. Um, this was problematic because we had to shut down the MySQL server, but system D would always bring it back up. So, and we couldn't control system D. So we, all, we had to first try to hinder MySQL at restarting, which was basically done by shutting down the server and then binding to the MySQL server port before the MySQL server come, comes back up, which will then hinder the MySQL server to bind to the same port because we already have we already bound to this port. Um, and this we also had to do this, uh, which is going to be the bind program you're going to be in, see, you're going to see in a second. But this is basically how you, we how we had to trick MySQL admin into returning a one, um, which will become clear in a second. So. Let's actually look at how this is done. Okay, first we copy the four interesting files to the device, which are the Zimlink program, the bind program I was talking about, the root shell, and the log rotate. Um, here you can see this the source for all the pro uh, for the uh, programs we copied over. You are going to see them uh, more detailed, uh, more, uh, more detailed, and more, more technically explained in our blog. So then we. Uh, access the device via SSH, and you can see we copied them over. And as you can see, the MySQL server is still running. So we have to fix that, I guess. Um, right. The, here, here you can see it's, it doesn't really matter, even if, with the wrong password, we would still return zero. So we started the program that tries to bind to the, to the port, and then we shut down the server. And with that, the program, our program was faster than the MySQL server and the MySQL server now isn't really brought, being brought up. And the MySQL admin returns a one, which is good for us. Now we can start the entire Zimlink procedure. So we first try to Zimlink mysql.log to, to a file root me and log rotate D. And now we have to trigger log rotate. For that, we have to fill the log of, uh, of the MySQL log and then wait eight to 10 minutes um, for, for log rotate to actually execute because it only executes every roughly 10 minutes. As you can see, um, that was done. We created the file inside log rotate D and now we can copy the, uh, the, the uh, second log rotate script into that script, trigger log rotate again and then we have to wait again for a bit. And now, as you can see, the uh, SUID bit is set on our tem. Oh, okay, now it's called root, uh, but it's still the same. It's still the same program. Um, we, you can see, the SUID bit is set on this program, uh, which is good for us because now we can uh, just execute passwd for root and set a new root password. And now, as you can see, we can log in as root. And this is basically how we gain uh, root access to the, to the Zealous Smart Gateway. It's 350. Right. And now I would like to uh, give the talk to Sebastian, who will talk, uh, who will tell you about the Gira Smart Gateway. All right. So let's have a look at 
on the second device that we hacked during our project. It's a Gira TKS IP gateway. It's a Linux-based system running on an ARM processor. And you can see the device on the right side with its plastic shell removed. So we obtained the device after we found some static credentials and static secrets and some other configuration and software issues in the firmware. And after that, we decided, okay, we should buy the hardware and have a look on the hardware side as well. So after obtaining the device and setting it up like it was described in the manual, we started to hook it up to the network port and run a NMAP port scan against it. So we discovered a few ports. There were one web server port and another web server port and a drop bear SSH port running on port 2222. So, and, and some other ports as well, but those are not really relevant to this talk, or at least we didn't really use them in any exploit. However, after buying the device and opening it, we discovered two SD cards in it. So the upper SD card is the ex so-called external SD card, which is encrypted. And yeah, that one you can remove if, even if the plastic shell is, is on it. So this, that's why it's called external. But the more interesting SD card is the internal one, which is below the external, because that one is not encrypted and it has a simple extended three file system, but you cannot really exit it um, unless you open the device. So let's have a look on what we found. The first bug was a classic path reversal issue and that one was within the first web server. So let's exp let me explain how this whole web server thing works. So there's this initial web server running on port 80 and then there's this second web server running on a different port but this second web server is the main application web server. It's written in Java and covers all the heavy load functionality which handles the web interface, etc., and which is only started once a user browses to this initial web server running on port 80 and being redirected to the other one. So this initial web server's purpose is quite limited in functionality, and that's why it's written in C. But the first configuration issue was that in order to bind to port 80, so after you type in the IP address, it would redirect you to the main application web server was bound to port 80. And to bind to port 80, you need to be root. So this initial web server was running it as root. And it had some, a little bit more functionality like displaying a about page about the developers or allowing to download some configuration or example or static files from, from the device. So we can get access to the second one. And this download functionality had this path reversal issue because it would take um, the path from the URL and use that as a suffix to the slash TKS slash Linux um, path on, on, on the device. And yeah, that allowed us to download some interesting files. The first one was slash app slash db slash gira dot db, which is the SQLite database which of all the settings, all the login credentials, and all the configuration, um, which is used by the main application web server. So this would allow to obtain the admin login username and the hashed MD5 hashed password. And the other interesting file was the global log file slash app slash sd internal slash messages um, because the heavy load web server would log anything, all debug stuff to this specific file. And it would even log the post requests data. So that means any keystroke typed in on the login form was username and password would be logged into this file. So this made obtaining admin credentials to this device even easier. So let's have a look on the live demo.
So at first you see the web interface with the backup and restore functionality. Keep, keep that picture in mind for the second exploit that we're going to talk about in a second. Um, but for now, look at the first exploit. This is just a curl command with the path reversal. And we have to use dash dash pass as is to just send this whole dot dot slash combination to the web server and obtain the gira.db database file. So after that, you can just use SQLite 3 to read any data from the database. And in our case, we obtain the admin username and the hash. Now we use the hash, put it into a file, and then yeah, use any cracking tool like John to crack it. So that's pretty straightforward and easy. And with those credentials, you can log into the web interface again. So now the second exploit, in that case, we download the slash app slash sd internal slash messages. And as you can see, there's every keystroke of our admin login procedure, including the password that we just cracked. And those are in plain text, so you don't even need to fire up your cracking rig if, if you can just read this file. And the administrator has logged in recently. Yeah, so with read access to this device and um, yeah, being able to read any file from the device, we had some initial foothold on it, so we could dig further into it, read through more configuration files, see if they match what we've seen in the firmware images, and explore the system even further. So with this backup functionality that you've seen in the beginning of the video, we tried to get write access to the device because once you post or upload the file with a post request it would write the whole file's raw contents into this slash app slash sd internal slash upload the temp file and after the upload has finished it would move this file around and try to restore the whole device so our hacker mind started up and thought, okay, what if we can replace this upload.temp file with a symlink to any other file on the SD card or on the whole system? Maybe we could just overwrite a file and or create a new file and then somehow get it triggered and executed so we can get root access, a reverse shell or something along that. So we tried to do that. It was kind of cumbersome because each attack attempt took about five to 10 minutes because you had to shut down the device, um, take out the internal SD card, plug it into our computer, mount it, create the sim link, and then unmount it, put it back into the device, boot the device again, and then trigger this upload functionality. So after a few tries and quite a few hours of wasted time, we found out that this file which is created um, is created as root because the second web server also runs as root. And only with the caveat that we cannot overwrite any existing files because we would check if the file already existed. And we couldn't create any file that would persist a reboot because after the backup process was initiated, the device would reboot and any newly created file would be lost for some reason. And the third caveat was that the permissions of the created files were non-executable. So with all those constraints, we didn't really manage to find a super easy um, exploit path. And with keeping in mind that this exploit would require physical access, um, that means being able to dismantle the device, remove the plastic shell, access the, the internal SD card, we thought, okay, well, maybe this isn't really a feasible exploit in, in, in the real world. So we continued to look into other stuff. And this is when we became root on the device because we kept looking at this backup and restore functionality and eventually find, found out that this backup file is just a tar archive. 
So you could easily just untar it and then have a look on all the configuration files that are stored within it and that would be restored um, if the file would be uploaded back again. So after looking into all the shell scripts with, which were related to this restoration process, we found out, okay, um, the configured host name, which is stored in the database, is read into a variable called $hname, which is a few lines down the script used in an sed command to create a configuration file for some service um, based on a template. So, so it would replace this placeholder at name at with the configured host name. And we thought, okay, maybe we can do some command injection with that because obviously there's this sed command and then we have like the contents of our variable um, replaced in there. So maybe we can add something else. And so we first tried the usual things like dollar sign parentheses and the other exploit, but it didn't really work. And that was somehow strange, but in the end, after playing around with it even more, we came up with the following exploit. Um, it looks like this. So we didn't really manage to e inject any new um, commands, like in a classic um, shell command injection, but instead we managed to inject new parameters to this sed command. And there, there are a few parameters that we could use to our advantage. So at first, we injected dash f pointing to a file with additional um, that command that would be executed. In that, in our case, it's the file slash app slash sd internal slash um, that hack. And this file we were able to create by putting it into our tar archive um, and yeah, upload it because the tar archive would be untarred to this path and then the file would be created for us. So this was great. And then we had the additional parameter dash i slash etc slash shadow. So you can tell SCD to not only replace um, the contents that it matches in, in, in the file path and then output the changed um, information on, on standard out, but you can tell it, okay, do an inline um, replacement or in file replacement. So it reads this file, replaces it and writes it back. So this is what we did with dash i, and we um, told that to replace contents in the etc shadow. And then we had dash e for additional regular expressions, I believe. Um, and in addition to that, we had to put in a few of the um, blue characters at the beginning and a few of the red characters in, in the end. So we would... Um, match with the initial um, search and the replace part of the initial command. So we kind of do it like in um, SQL injection that we have to finish the first part and finish the last part and in between our own added commands or parameters are. So what did we do with this kind of attack? Well, we thought, okay, we can download the etc shadow file so we know the um, password hash of the root user. And with this command, we can actually give that more um, instructions to modify this etc shadow file. So why not simply replace the old password hash with a new one? And that's what we did. So we placed this um, slash as, no, sorry, as slash root um, old password hash, replace it with um, root this new password hash, slash g into this zhack file and then change this host name in the database to this injection string, restored the whole thing and waited a few minutes. So it would trigger this command injection and yeah, change the root user's password. So after that, it was just logging in via SSH. And that's what, what we did.
So let's have a look at the live demo. So we first move our downloaded file, which was the beginning of the first video. Then we created a shell script, which would modify all the things like untaring the um, archive, changing the um, integrity checks. They were just MD5 hashes of the files and would, it would also create this Zcat file. So yeah, this was pretty easy with the shell script. And then we would log in back to the device. We would choose our modified um, exploit file as a yeah, backup tag, I have uploaded, and then it would take about five to 10 minutes to do all the restoration. So we cut it out of the video here. And yeah, in the end, the restoration was successful and we can download the ETC shadow to have a look at it. And we see that the password chain uh, hash was changed. So now we could log into the device. However, um, the drop your SSH version was so old that it didn't really work with any modern open SSH anymore. So we had to download drop your client. And after that, we SSH into this device. So we got root at it using this weird parameter injection. So what are lessons learned from all this hacking on the devices? So we believe that initial firmware analysis is a good approach because it's cheap in automation. When you can download it, you can extract it, you can um, run any tools like grab, um, et cetera, on the files to, to, to look for secrets, files, configuration, sensitive information. You can even parallelize this whole process like telling your few colleagues, okay, you look at this part of the firmware, you look at this part of the firmware, and in the end, it gives you a, a rough idea if this device is any good to exploit, any good to hack, is, are there any, much vulnerabilities or not. So then you can think about buying this device. Um, however, on, on the con side, we have that this firmware is sometimes not available, so you can't download it or it's encrypted, so you can't really um, look into it. And maybe even if you set it up with a Raspberry Pi like we did, some features would not work. Like for the Skira thing, it expected two partitions or two SD cards to work with, and we didn't really have that on, on the Pi. So several things would fail, backup process didn't work, which we used to get root on the device. Um, and we had, we even had to manipulate and change a few startup script because it was looking for some peripherals that weren't present on the Pi. So this took a bit of time and it's a con, but nonetheless, we thought this was a good approach for us. So what, um, have you learned about our test devices? An actual live system, like it's supposed to be, provided from the vendor with all the configuration, all the working firmware, all the peripherals um, is indeed a good investment. If you have the money, in our case it was several, like about a thousand euros per device that we had to spend. Um, if you have the money and the time, you should definitely get the devices and it makes things easier. You can even look at the hardware side of things. Are there any JTAG or debug connectors? Um, what what else is there security hardware wise? And then you can also run all the exploits against an actual target and not your emulated st stuff on the Pi where things might not work um, as they should. However, as I just said, it's super expensive and it takes time. Like we didn't really buy a whole door setup, which would go into quite a few thousands, but we just limited ourselves to those control devices and try to work with that. And that even cost, uh, cost us about 1,000 um, euros per device and a lot of time to configure it, read the manuals and everything. So yeah, having both sides of a firmware and analysis thing and test devices is great. But yeah, you, you should think about if you have the money and the time for that. So with that, I will give over to Lars and he'll go into the details of what we thought was surprisingly strong and surprisingly wrong. So thanks, Sebastian, for this insight. Um, so uh, 
surprisingly strong was that there were few obvious flaws and there was good cryptography. Um, they had signed updates, they had mostly strong passwords, especially in the important places where passwords they needed you to set it yourself. So that's, well, a different story because that's how the user chooses to how much security he wants to put in there. But um, yeah, so very few things that were like, okay, this is directly broken and I just can log in. Um, there were some flaws though. Um, there was some um, shell scripting, self-made uh, shell scripting, which is kind of common for uh, IoT devices and all this hardware closed stuff. But on the other hand, it's quite prone to errors and we found some errors in there that, yeah, made it possible for us to get root access right. So I would advise everyone to take self-made uh, shell scripts with a grain of salt. And then there were some basic misconfigurations which were just kind of unexpected because they are not like the best practice standards and stuff like that. So how did we manage to access root? We had a like roadmap for us. And the first thing was uh, we want to get um, unprivileged access so that we can look around on the system with the shell and yeah, well, search around it for our way to escalate our privileges. Therefore, we use static passwords, hashes, default credentials, misconfigurations of many kinds, command injections. And in the end, you saw we found a way in. And then for escalating privileges, we just checked vulnerability databases and then looked into every SUID binary to um, check whether we could execute it, manipulate it, or stuff like that, because that's a way, yeah, to create our own uh, escalation vulnerability. And on a side note, we uh, try to move via the physical access, but that's a whole different attack vector. But uh, yeah, we pursued that too. Um, so now, when we found all this stuff, we went to disclose it. So this is like the final step of the disclosure. At first, uh, we talked to the vendors and made sure that they have patches ready before we give this talk so that there, if you update your system, it should not be vulnerable to this flaws anymore or this vulnerabilities uh, at the point where uh, we tell people how to exploit it. And they had a really great communication with us. They didn't went for legal threats or lawsuits or anything. They just like said, thank you, we will fix it. Um, Siedler even provided us with a pre-release image so that we could look at it again and say, yeah, we checked all our recent findings that we sent you and they don't work anymore and yeah was a very good and pleasant experience. Um, furthermore, a more detailed or a, a more um, less time constrained uh, information on this is uh, findable at our blog at uh, research.highsolutions.com. So for, for f finishing it off, um, I would say uh, in this talk, we brought the focus to IoT devices. Um, we took a, yeah, a pretty, pretty close look at one special kind of IoT devices, which is um, the gateways. And um, we showed exploit chains for the two of them. And yeah, that for us shows IoT devices are still broken. I mean, we only showed it for two, but our general conception is, yeah, 
we wouldn't trust it too much and we uh, would advise especially for um, entry physical entry to leave it to physical access but as we already pointed out there are many yeah pros for doing it with a gateway but we would advise you to check thoroughly if they are actually safe so this is it and i think we will be open for questions now and thank you very much right so guys thank you for that awesome awesome talk um i have two questions on slido um the first is what tools are used for static analysis um well, for the uh, for the files that we looked at beforehand when we downloaded the firmware, we mainly used like common tools like Grab or Binwalk um, that, that you would usually usually do uh, usually use. And for the binaries, we looked at with uh, with Ghidra and Ida uh, just to get like different outputs and compare them, see if if they uh, disassemble sort of the similar thing. Um, and I think we shortly had a look at the Java server. Uh, we did that with JD GUI, but um, we we didn't really see anything there. Okay, thanks. And the second question I have is, are these devices normally installed in the LAN, so the attacker needs to have access to the local network, or are they sometimes exposed to the internet? Um, well, um, they are at first meant to be in the local uh, LAN network. So um, as you can see in the slide, I put it up again, uh, they have the typical Ethernet port adapter and you just connect it into your LAN. On the other hand, sometimes uh, uh, they make mistakes in the installment. So we looked up on Showdown and we found some of them in the internet. So there are definitely some in, that are exposed to the internet. How many of them, I actually don't know. And furthermore, uh, often they are in some uh, local area network that is also uh, connected or has some wireless parts. And then it gets interesting again if you can reach that from outside of the building with a laptop or something and it's not too well protected or something. Okay, cool. Thank you very much.